Inside our body, we have two types of cells which are predominantly responsible for actually storing and breaking down glycogen. So these cells are the skeletal muscle cells and the liver cells. Now, skeletal muscle cells are responsible for creating and generating voluntary motion. And so when skeletal muscle cells break down glycogen into glucose, they use that glucose to basically produce the ATP molecules, the energy molecules needed to create voluntary motion. On the other hand, liver cells are responsible for actually maintaining and regulating the proper blood glucose levels in our body. And so when liver cells actually break down glycogen into glucose, they can release that glucose into the blood and that helps our body maintain the correct level of glucose in our cardiovascular system. Now, what I'd like to discuss in this lecture is what ultimately is the signal that initiates the breakdown, uh, the breakdown of glycogen in our liver cells as well as in our skeletal muscle cells. So let's begin by focusing on liver cells. So there are two important types of hormones that play a role in actually signaling the breakdown of glycogen in liver cells. And these hormones are glucagon and epinephrine. Now, glucagon plays a much greater role in liver cells than epinephrine, but in skeletal muscle cells, it's epinephrine that actually initiates the breakdown of glycogen. So let's imagine that our body's undergoing starvation. And so what that means is in our blood plasma, we have a relatively low concentration of glucose. And to basically increase the level of glucose, the liver cells have to begin breaking down the glycogen into glucose and release that glucose into the blood plasma. So how exactly does this process actually take place? This is what we call the glucagon signal transduction pathway. So let's take a look at the following diagram, which basically outlines this complicated process. So we begin in the alpha cells of the pancreas. The alpha cells of the pancreas basically produce this peptide hormone we call glucagon. And once glucagon makes its way into the bloodstream, it then travels onto the membrane of liver cells. On the membrane of liver cells is a receptor, a 7 transmembrane receptor, 7TM receptor, known as the glucagon receptor. And glucagon binds onto this side of this glucagon receptor shown in orange. And once the binding takes place, that initiates a process on the other side of this 7TM receptor protein. So on the other side, we have this G protein that contains a GDP bound to it. When the GDP is bound to it, it is inactive. But upon the binding of glucagon, the GDP is expelled and a GTP enters this pocket. And once the GTP is bound, it activates the G protein and causes it to actually dissociate from this orange glucagon receptor. And once this G protein dissociates, it moves on onto adenylate cyclase. And what it does is it stimulates adenylate cyclase, an enzyme, to basically begin the catalyzation, the transformation of ATP molecules into cyclic AMP molecules. Now, cyclic AMP molecules are secondary messengers, whereas the glucagon hormones are primary messengers in this glucagon signal transduction pathway. And so what cyclic AMP molecules do is they move on and bind onto the inactive version of PKA. So blue means inactive and red means active. Now, when cyclic AMP bind onto the regulatory sites of PKA, they cause the dissociation of those regulatory sites from the catalytic sites, from those catalytic subunits, and that activates those catalytic subunits. So once this process takes place, that activates PKA protein kinase A. And remember that protein kinase A is capable of actually phosphorylating and thereby activating many other target proteins. And in this particular signal transduction pathway, the target protein is phosphorylase kinase. 
So remember from a previous discussion that phosphorylase kinase must be activated by two different factors. One is phosphorylation and the other one is calcium. So let's focus on the phosphorylation for just a moment. So we have PKA, which is activated by the binding of cyclic AMP, goes on and activates phosphorylase kinase. And what phosphorylase kinase does is it goes on and activates glycogen phosphorylase. Now glycogen phosphorylase is that enzyme that initiates step one of glycogen breakdown. So ultimately we see that the signal, the primary messenger molecule that initiates glycogen breakdown in the liver cells is in fact glucagon. Now, what about epinephrine? Epinephrine also actually plays an important role, but a smaller, a smaller role in liver cells. Epinephrine binds to beta adrenergic receptors as well as alpha adrenergic receptors. When it binds to the beta adrenergic receptor, it basically follows a similar pathway to the pathway outlined here, but when epinephrine which is, by the way, a tyrosine-based hormone, when epinephrine actually binds onto the alpha adrenergic receptor, what it does is initiates the phosphonosatide cascade. And what, that, and what that cascade actually does is, it basically stimulates the release of calcium ions that are stored inside the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum of these liver cells. And so we have the influx of these calcium ions into the cytoplasm of the liver cell and remember from our discussion on phosphorylase kinase that the calcium ions actually bind onto the delta units of phosphorylase kinase. And so on top of phosphorylating the phosphorylase kinase to actually activate this enzyme, the calcium ions also have to bind to the phosphorylase kinase. So we see that glucagon actually stimulates PKA to phosphorylate the phosphorylase kinase, while the epinephrine helps release the calcium ions, which are also needed to actually activate the phosphorylase kinase. And together, this causes the activation of the phosphorylase kinase that is needed to ultimately begin the process of glycogen breakdown inside the liver cells of our body. Now, for skeletal muscle cells, it's epinephrine that basically stimulates the breakdown of glycogen and the ultimate generation of ATP from the glucose molecules, and this allows the skeletal muscles to actually generate voluntary motion.